Picture this. You're part of one of the biggest boy bands in history, selling millions of records, topping charts, and living the high life. But behind the scenes, a dark secret is unraveling. While someone else is making millions, you can't even afford your apartment in Orlando. But how is this possible? The answer lies with one man, Lou Pearlman. We've been touring for about almost two years. Number one albums. Countless, countless radio promotions. Things were going great for us. This is as good as it gets right here. If you weren't alive during the late 90s and early 2000s, NSYNC and the Backstreet Boys were the epitome of boy bands, with the combined album sales of 170 million, cementing their status as magic legends. However, behind the glitz and glamour, a different reality was taking shape. There were whispers of Lou Pearlman's questionable behaviour, with rumours surfacing about his misconduct. But the enigmatic nature of Lou made it hard to discern the truth. Was he truly the mastermind behind the scenes of these bands, or was he hiding something a little bit more sinister? Lou was the kind of person that you're never really sure if he's telling you the truth. A schemer and a liar. That's probably the best way of summing up his personality. On the one hand, Lou gave aspiring musicians a chance at stardom, creating not only NSYNC and the Backstreet Boys, but other groups such as Innocence, C-Note, Take 5, LFO, and even launching Aaron Carter's career. But of course it wasn't all glitz and glamour. There was a dark side to this empire. If you're able to convince banks to lend you money, you're pretty good at defrauding people. In 2006, Lou Pearlman actually pled guilty to conspiracy, money laundering and making false statements during a bankruptcy proceeding. This led to his conviction and a 25 year prison sentence in 2008. Unfortunately, well depending on who you ask, in 2016 he passed away while in custody, taking with him not only his secret, but also any chance of restitution for the over $300 million he squirreled away during this time. But how did he actually build this empire? Well, Lou Pearlman, the man behind the biggest boy bands and the fraudulent schemes, had humble beginnings in the streets of Queens, New York. Born to Jewish parents, he was the only son in the family. From an early age, Pearlman developed a fascination with two things. The first being aviation, something that was evident throughout his life, and the second being music. If his dream of soaring through the skies didn't come to fruition, then the second dream of becoming a musician would have done just fine. Lou Pearlman recalled seeing his cousin, Art Garfunkel, do a guitar performance at his bar mitzvah, which led young Lou to pick up the guitar himself. When I was eight years old, I loved playing the guitar. I wanted to get into the guitar because I saw my cousin, Art Garfunkel. While his teenage years may have been spent playing music, in the early 80s, Pillman ventured into his other dream, flying. This time, of course, though, it was the blimp business, striking multi-million dollar deals with companies like MetLife and SeaWorld. I saw the Goodyear blimp flying outside my window, and I was like, you know, what is this thing flying around? But it intrigued me. It was the World's Fair at the time, and I managed to get a ride on it. I was hooked. And I love flying. However, it was his foray into chartering airplane flights that would eventually lead him to a fateful encounter with the new kids on the block, a pivotal moment in his rise as a music mogul. These kids did $200 million in record sales and $800 million in touring and merchandising. I was like, I'm in the wrong business. <laughs> Pillman's ambition and financial investment were apparent from the start. He was pouring millions of dollars into recruiting young talent and providing them with extensive training, including dance lessons, voice coaching, and music education. The magnitude of his, I guess what you could call dedication to creating these boy bands was remarkable. Although of course, this was not down to altruism. He wasn't doing this as charity. He was essentially gamifying and turning into a business, the art of making musical groups. Something that of course you could draw a parallel to many years later in modern day South Korean pop, where bands are essentially created by corporations, with members usually being plucked from the public and trained all the way through, essentially living their entire lives like sports stars from an early age. Having very little personal life and training being dedicated to their craft the entire time. And if it didn't work out, well, unlucky, there's plenty of other people next in line. 
the cute and sexy Backstreet Boys. For Pillman though, back in the West before anyone was really doing this, things seemed to be going just great. The boy bands he was putting this money into were starting to gain traction, and his life was about to change dramatically. He was already a rich man, but he'd never seen money like this before. On top of that, not just money, he was getting a taste of fame, he was in the public eye, and these things combined turned into excitement and later greed. There was also a rather insidious and weird element to this. Perlman, in his own words, referred to himself as their quote, Big Papa, emphasising the risks he had taken and the financial backing he had provided. Essentially saying without them he was nothing and they were disposable, adding additional elements of power control to their already imbalanced lives. Now let's dive deeper into the intricate web of Lou Perlman's life, exploring the heights of his success and of course what laid beneath the surface. Mr. Lou Perlman, the man who started it all. Where do we go from here? Onward and upward. In the glittering, glamorous world of pop music where fame and fortune go hand in hand, there was always going to be drama. There was going to be hate, there was going to be lawsuits, and of course there would also be shocking truth unveiled eventually. How it all started was when the boys, which is what they were, of course the talented young members of NSYNC and Backstreet Boys, sought to renegotiate their contracts, demanding a fair share of the massive wealth that they'd helped generate. You see, until now, they were just lucky to have the privilege. They were picked, but they were replaceable. But they had ideas of their own, and these ideas were not in line with Lou Perlman, who just wanted to take all the money for himself. How dare these boys fight back against Big Papa himself? What ensued was a legal battle that would expose one of the worst contracts in music history and reveal the true nature of the man who had orchestrated their rise to stardom. Who'd have thought that a grown man collecting boys and asking them to call him Big Papa would abuse his power in such a way? Now I do of course want to impress on you if you weren't around at this time, the popularity of people like the Backstreet Boys. They were bringing in millions of dollars and the sky was the limit. What they discovered though was that Lou Pearlman took over 10 million dollars and left for them 300,000 between all of them. And remember there was five of them, so they were essentially getting $60,000 each for being the most popular musical act in the world at this time. But you know what's even worse is that the Backstreet Boys had it fantastically compared to NSYNC, who were actually being paid $35 per day each. And while of course, from a business perspective, they did sign these contracts knowing what they were getting themselves into, both Backstreet Boys and NSYNC were young at this time. They had no idea about business, they couldn't afford lawyers. And you had this multi-millionaire coming in promising big things, saying that they'd renegotiate later, and they were just happy for the opportunity. NSYNC, for example, was 16 years old at the time, and all they wanted to do was make their music, tour the world, meet their fans, and just live that life. They had no idea they'd even be that successful, and when they were, they assumed, of course, Big Papa would take care of them, but what they found out is that he was only taking care of himself. To make matters even worse, NSYNC was sued by Lou for their name. He claimed ownership as the sixth member of the group, and as everyone should know, legal battles are expensive, and who are they going to favour? The people earning $35 a day, or the multi-millionaire who's pulling in tens of millions of dollars, exploiting these teenagers. Of course everyone assumes that fame equals wealth, and generally that is true, though not for anybody signed to Lou Pearlman. Well, the worst thing is uh, people thinking that we were rich, because um, we were not. Uh, Lou, Lou Pearlman all stole all your we money. We were famous, but we were not rich. Um, yeah, I mean, I make... I made way more money after NSYNC than I did during NSYNC. I mean, they, I mean he, they, he really took majority of all of our stuff and the record label too. Horrible, horrible deals. And for Lou, he essentially parlayed these ill-gotten gains into expanding his own empire. Transcontinental now stood as a conglomerate, branching out beyond the music industry, from acquiring TCBY, the yogurt company, to purchasing Chippendales and NYPD Pizza, Lou expanded Transcontinental into over 100 different businesses, transforming it into a global entity. And the vast majority of it was built off the back of exploiting these young men. And while no one really seemed to care at this point, it wasn't long before the truth was going to come to light. For people who knew Lou Pearlman, and I mean really knew him, they wouldn't be surprised that this was all deception. He presented himself as a wealthy figure, yet the whereabouts of his money 
remained elusive. Transcontinental Airlines, for instance, had no airplanes, no employees, and no revenue. A clear indicator of fraud. In 2006, investigators made a jaw-dropping discovery. Lou Perlman had essentially orchestrated a massive Ponzi scheme, defrauding investors out of over $1 billion. And what's even more mind-boggling is that $300 million of that money is still missing to this day. You see, for more than two decades, Perlman enticed individuals and banks to invest in his fictional companies, including Transcontinental Airlines Incorporated, Transcon Records, and Transcontinental International Incorporated. These entities only existed on paper until the immense success of his boy bands turned them into profit-generating machines. Of course, many people claim that Bernie Madoff was the person running the longest Ponzi scheme with around 17 years, although it may have been a little bit longer. But actually, Lou Pearlman was running his Ponzi scheme for over 20 before he was eventually caught. What's funny is that Pearlman was also completely delusional about what it was he was doing. In 2013, after five years in prison, Lou was interviewed behind bars. The Hollywood Reporter said, I wanted to hear what he thought about comparisons to Bernie Madoff. He felt Bernie was a true criminal, whereas he was not because he had the boy band thing going. Perlman sort of put Madoff at arm's length and said, well that's a real criminal. I'm a legitimate guy and things just kind of got out of my control and so I'm not a real criminal. While in prison, Lou Perlman tried to remain productive, soliciting industry contacts to help him create a prison-based TV show, with him, of course, as the star. He would hold tryouts between the inmates for a new boy band, one made up completely of criminals. All he needed was permission and workers to come in and film it, which, to be honest, would probably have worked and been great viewing. Unfortunately, it never came to fruition, but Lou never stopped scheming. That is until he, as a self-proclaimed innocent man, died behind bars in 2016, just eight years into his 25-year sentence. Lou's death was bittersweet for those who count themselves as his victims. Sometimes they hated him, sometimes they loved him, they didn't really know how to feel. For some, they loved him for giving them status and fame which would otherwise never have existed. For others, they hated him for what came with it and the potential for what could have been. But for all, he was still a monster. One who many made allegations of sexual exploitation to go along with his other crimes. Big Papa was allegedly exerting his control and power over the young men throughout his 20-year reign. So that's Lou Perlman, a man who created one of the largest, longest-running Ponzi schemes in history and funneled that money into creating a boy band empire, the likes of which will never be replicated. And a man who didn't care who he hurt while doing so. When it comes to the realization of like, dang, you know, you thought this guy was going to be for you. And yes, we are grateful, but at the same time, if greed didn't become such a part of what we were, you know, we were just some young kids that wanted to sing and, and make a mark and, mm -hmm. and not be marked up from all of the crap, you know? Mm -hmm. And so it, you know, our path changed. And to find out he's been a con man this whole time makes you think, was anything ever true? Anything you ever said to us or did for us was ever, was it all really true or was it half and half or was it all bullshit?